Hi, you're listening to Hello Audio, a podcast by The Venue Berlin. Every episode, we bring you the latest topics and the best entrepreneurs of music, audio, and tech. Hello Audio by The Venue Berlin. This podcast episode is a recap of the afterwork session about podcast monetization. Our guest speakers were Christoph Falke, the Managing Director of Audio at Axel Springer SE. We then added snippets of our live event from Vincent Kitman and James Harper to give a well-rounded perspective on the issue of podcast monetization to date. We hope you enjoy this episode and that you will gain valuable insights for your own podcast. Thanks for the quick introduction, Josie. I'm Helen from the Venue Berlin, and I'm sitting here with Christoph Falke, Head of Audio from Axel Springer. We're talking about podcast monetization today. Christoph, please introduce yourself first. Uh, sure. First of all, thank you for the invitation. My name is Christoph. I'm the Managing Director of Axel Springer Audio, and I'm responsible for the audio portfolio, which includes a bunch of market-leading radio stations, as well as online audio invest. I would love to uh, kick in with this, maybe just a general overview of the market, and then we can dive a bit deeper into podcast monetization. I would like to ask you what trends you currently see in the German podcasting scene and what has changed over the past years. Okay. I mean, first of all, it's not surprising that uh, podcasting is definitely a growth market in terms of reach and as well in terms of revenues. And the variety of podcasts had exploded in the last year. And currently have, we have approximately 5,000 active podcasts, which is really an astonishing number. And um, I think also the production quality has increased and therefore also the production budgets, which is good news. Vincent Kittman also sees an uptrend in the German podcasting market. What we see in, in podcast monetization or in the uh, overall podcast market is that the, the American market is kind of two th uh, or three years ahead of the German market what, uh, what it, uh, because of the development. And we watch ex uh, exactly this statistic we watched since 2016. And um, it's growing every year. And even though when we, when we saw it on, uh, at, at 2016, the estimation for 2017, 2018 were always lower than it than really um, the, the result at the end of the year. So um, yeah, we really yeah, surprised by the, by the development. And there are even studies out there, or um, opinions out there, that, uh, who think that at 2020, 2021, the US podcast ad spend will crack the 1 billion uh, mark. So yeah, there's uh, still a lot of potential um, to see uh, if you compare to TV or radio, podcast is still a lot smaller. But I think uh, a business which is growing to one billion dollar mark is uh, is quite big for its own. And what are the big players right now in Germany? Well, I think you should distinguish between the distribution play mm -hmm. and also the production and sales side. And of course, distribution-wise, Apple is still the dominant player, but Spotify is catching up right now. And I think we are still waiting for a convincing solution in the Android world. Because, I mean, Google has launched the podcast app, but it's not really uh, successful right now, as far as I know. Uh, and I hope there will be a solution in the future in this field. And on the production side, of course, Spotify is also doing a lot of stuff. But uh, there are also early movers like the online marketing rock stars with the Podstars label. And it will be also interesting to see how RTL, in particular the new audio alliance of Bertelsmann and Prosim that Eins are able to push the market forward within the next years. So yeah, that's, that's the play right now. Christoph just told us who the big players are in terms of media companies who are investing in podcasts in Germany. Vincent, focus on what specific podcasts are the most successful in Germany at the moment. The market leader um, for the German market, uh, uh, yeah, the one podcast is uh, Fest und Flauschig from Jan Böhmermann and Olli Schulz. 
And they are on the podcast market for quite a while, which one of the first uh, podcasts I listened to. So I'm uh, still a big fan. <laughs> and um, yeah, they're still a little big. Uh, they're um, for whew, three, four years now, they're uh, exclusively at Spotify. What I hear, hear as rumors, they compile uh, around yeah, six figure, high six figures, uh, nearly to, to, to one million uh, listeners per episode. A lot of podcasts like uh, Alle Wege für Nahum with, with Jogo Winterscheid and Paul Rübke, who are um, high above uh, six figures listener numbers. Um, there's one uh, Gemischtes Hack, um, maybe you know them um, as a podcast. They are probably close to Fest and Flauschig, what, what I heard as, as a rumors. I, um, yeah, but those are the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest podcasts in Germany. In, in general, you can say if you have a podcast with over 100,000 listeners in, in Germany, you are already in the top spot of uh, German podcasts. I mean, we know that the German market is quite early stage, but we see podcasting as super big in the US, of course, but also in Asia. Mm -hmm. What are the differences and why are we so far behind? Well, I mean, uh, talking about the US, of course, the market size of the USA compared to Germany is 10 times bigger. And the podcast revenue is almost 100 times higher. So... In the U.S., the consolidation is further advanced and there's, of course, more money in the market. And it's not only about the, the Gimlet deal. To give you one example, in August, there was announced that the radio company Entercom has acquired uh, Pinal Street Media and Cadence 13 and uh, for a price of approximately $70 million. dollars. I mean, this is really a tremendous amount of money. But in terms of usage, as you mentioned before, everybody's talking about the US, but especially Asia, South Korea really are way ahead in terms of usage. So it's not only the United States. Are there different revenue models in China compared to the US? Well, to be honest, hard to, hard mm. to say mm. <laughs> since I'm not able to, mm. to get a real uh, deep insights of the market. I mean, we have this language barrier, mm -hmm. which is um, yeah, definitely... Uh, an issue we have to solve. If we talk about trends, I think everyone has seen the trend that more and more platforms are trying to create a form of Netflix for podcasting. Mm. What do you think about this trend? If everyone's just putting a paywall in front of his own platform, is that going to be worth it? What do you think about it? Well, first of all, I would say uh, Netflix, of course, is a great company mm -hmm. uh, with almost 100 and something billion euros of market capitalization. So it's a really a good role model. But to build a subscription-based podcast service is really an ambitious goal and needs time. So companies like Luminary needs a really good funding, which they have, about $100 million. So it's obvious that there's a willingness to pay on the one hand because, or also by real fans, there are a lot of podcasts generating revenues from donations or from uh, ticket sales of their live recording events. But on the other hand, the challenge is that a lot of streaming uh, services, music streaming services, are integrating a lot of new podcast originals and they offer it more or less for free, although you still have to pay the basic monthly uh, subscription fee. I just thought, would it not make sense for a company, for example, like Netflix, to just acquire a company that is also in charge of podcasting and that already has all the users? Yeah, I mean, this mm. is a more or less general question because, I mean, there are a couple of people who said, okay, is there room for another big discovery platform? Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced since the usability of most of the products is not really convincing, there is room for a new player, which isn't in, in the place right now. And so regarding Netflix for podcasts, it's, it's not easy, but I keep my fingers crossed, of course. We also have other big players, which are radio stations in the field of audio. How do you think will they benefit from the whole podcasting development? Or many people say, well, the radio is dead, but it apparently never died in Germany. How do you think can radio stations make use of the podcasting development and maybe also find new ways of monetization? I mean, on the one hand, in general, I would say that they are quite experienced mm. when it comes to audio production and to be sure that the product sounds good. And on the other hand, of course, they can use their tremendous reach, which they still have. I mean, for example, our audio portfolio has a daily reach of over 20 million listeners, which is a huge amount. And so the challenge is to shift that listenership more to podcast. 
so I think they have a lot of good resources, but the challenge is, of course, they have to use it in a, in a very creative manner. Mm -hmm. I think in your portfolio, we have Antenne Bayern mm -hmm. and they have a sort of best practice model with mm -hmm. uh, Dunkle Heimat. Can you give us some insights about how the radio station made this podcast big and made it work? Well, I mean, this is the question, what is the secret sauce? <laughs> <laughs> and I personally think there are five major factors. First one is, of course, it's an outstanding story with a high production value and an amazing sound. If you just listen to the podcast, it's really astonishing. Secondly, I mean, Antenne Bayern brought together the right people. So on the one hand, we have the really good storytellers, which were basically screenwriters, TV screenwriters. We have a great host and we have the production expertise of the radio station. And thirdly, Antenne Bayern has started the format in 2017. And there were only a few competitors in this true crime genre. And fourthly, Dunkle Heimat is working on a seasonal basis. So uh, the second season, Nitre Bit, it's <laughs> a very German name, mm -hmm. of course, is benefiting from the success of the first season, Hinterkaifeck. Mm -hmm. because you have a, some kind of a basis you can work on. And the last point, I mean, everybody was talking and was writing about the format since it was number one on Apple Podcast. And so it helps to have a communication strategy and, of, of course, also the reach of the radio station for a successful launch. That's basically... I think what uh, what uh, sticked in my mind is that, of course, they were able to make the advertisement in the radio station mm -hmm. um, and also explain to people what a podcast actually is because I guess radio station not necessarily has the youngest listeners mm -hmm. and I think it it's great yeah. that they could explain to their audience what is actually going on. <laughs> yeah, but we, we solved mm -hmm. this issue. I mean, it's definitely mm -hmm. an issue that a lot of people don't know what podcast is mm -hmm. still. And we translate this for the radio listeners in Hörspiel mm -hmm. because this is more common. And for the, uh, let's say, internet online uh, community, of course, it was podcast things. So, I mean, and, and even, for example, the daily, uh, it, it's not called podcast. It's some kind of daily news report. Mm -hmm. So I think podcast is probably not the best word you can invent, but it's currently it's a standard of what we're doing. So we have to accept it. James Harper is a freelance podcaster. In the next snippet, he talks about crowdfunding and being featured on other podcasts. Okay, so it's been, what, nine months since I quit my last job? I need some money. And that's what we're all here to learn about, right? So good old German government. Uh, <laughs> I was entitled to some uh, as I'd, I'd worked in Germany for over a year, I'm a EU citizen, blah, blah, blah. So basically, I persuaded the German government that This was a great business plan. 60 pages in German in the end with these sorts of figures and charts, and it did the job, it worked. I had no idea what I was talking about, neither did they, so. But they said yes, it looked professional enough. What's interesting about this, though, is the listener numbers. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I thought you put great content out there, people come, right? Surely, if it's great content, people come. And then, obviously, the crushing reality is that it's really, 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 really hard to build an audience. Really, really, really hard. So, I mean, I'm, I'm at 25,000 now, but that's been a long, long journey. And I've, not 25,000 per episode, more total, but the point being, At some point, I realized that my list of numbers weren't going fast enough. The advertising that I was hoping to get wasn't going to be here. I needed a plan B because money was running out. So that takes me to early this year. So basically, I had to find ways to earn money, which was time effective and kind of related to coffee, or it kind of just really helped me you know, live, live a life of a freelancer while making filter stories my full-time job. We talked a lot about monetization of platforms right now, but there are lots of small podcasters, uh, DIY podcasters, who put a lot of work and effort into their own podcasts and they have no idea how to monetize it, even though they might already have a bit of a listenership. What mm. advice would you give to them? I think, first of all, of course, you need a lot of luck. This is, this is the truth because over 90% of all podcasts will not generate relevant money. That's the gameplay. But this is, it sounds depressing, but uh, at the end, I mean, that's the same in TV and other creative industries. And so I only can encourage them because, I mean, if Gabor Steingart has started his morning briefing podcast, more, he has started it more or less independently. He wasn't backed by a big media company. So, and now he's number one daily news podcast in Germany that shows to me what is possible. And of course, you have to find the right topic. I mean, this is basically do what you love thing. And of course, you need a good story. 
And a good podcast is more than just a usual talk at the kitchen table. And so at this point, I think a lot of people have to be honest with themselves because you do not ask only your best friends about their opinion. Because sometimes if you listen to this with a certain perspective, you will recognize, okay, there are a lot of things I can do better. And that's the thing. And of course, you have to promote it every day because otherwise it won't work. But there's no, let's say, special advice I can give to smaller podcasters just find your topic and I think this is something which is really not easy because there are so many different podcasts out there but it's a great opportunity for everyone because it's the best format for thrilling journalism for good storytelling yeah I mean maybe you have to let's say try it several times but after a while you will see okay maybe something works that's the way innovation goes my listeners will sometimes ask hey where can I try the coffee from the stories they're very curious. I didn't really have a good answer because the reality is, you know, you do a story about, you know, someone in Nicaragua, it's very hard to get their specific coffee if you're, you know, a lay consumer so sat in Germany. So what I did was I basically raised money. We raised over $3,000, 50 people came on board to buy basically coffee from Nicaragua, uh, actually from Central America, and we roasted, brought it to a roaster in the West and we roasted it up and then we shipped, shipped it around the world. And what was really cool about this Kickstarter idea is that not only that it worked, but my listenership doubled overnight doing this because all of a sudden, Filter Stories was on the Kickstarter platform, which has a lot of people. And, you know, you did various people and you're mentioned in coffee outlets and, you know, bloggers want to talk up to me and blah, 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 blah. So it all adds to the momentum behind Filter Stories. Because this is documentary investigative journalism, you know, kind of like serial style, I went to where the place where all the best creators of this kind of content go, which is the Third Coast International Audio Festival. And it's here I network like crazy and learned a lot about making better quality storytelling audio. And these are, you know, for example, I've, I've been in discussions with Planet Money, which is one of the biggest out there, to do a collaboration. Martina Castro, she is, she's quite famous in this niche world. But what this all led to was the first of my collaborations, where Filter Stories was featured on the Duolingo podcast. The Duolingo podcast, basically, it's like half Spanish, half English, helps you learn Spanish in a nice story. And their season finale this year, just last month when it launched, was my Tito story, which is an extraordinary kind of rags to riches story of a really down and out coffee producer in Panama. Probably one of my best. And, you know, Duolingo was, you know, in the top best of 2018 podcast last year, so it gets a lot of traffic. What's really cool here is that all of a sudden I was getting paid for my stories. So, you know, so money landed in the bank account, but also I got a shout out. So now if you listen to the story, you directed the filter stories. Yeah, I think most podcasters are hoping to receive money via sponsored ads. But of course, it's very difficult to approach them. Lots of podcasts are also very niche, which might be a pro and a con for a sponsorship. What issues do you think uh, podcasters currently face when it comes to sponsorship? I mean, of course, the basic challenge is, first of all, to get access to the ad clients. But my personal experience is that if you have a niche podcast with very clear topic and you are a host who is quite familiar with the network with the community there it might be easier especially easier for you personally to find the right client because usually if you're talking about i don't know if you're talking about the future of music production you probably will say okay what about native instruments or stuff like that so at the end if you're a smaller podcast and don't have a certain download level a couple of thousand downloads every week or per episodes it's the best way to get access to your clients by your own at the end mm -hmm. and at a certain level you can say okay i have to go to a sales house or to a big label which supports me but yeah it's hard work another way of getting money would be potentially be pitching your podcast to a platform as an original yeah i think mm -hmm. donations are especially more usual in the u.s mm -hmm. compared to germany so far but this is definitely a revenue stream and the other thing which is doing really good is these um, live recording sessions where mm -hmm. you say okay i have access to a small uh, venue and every listener or every uh, guest is charged with a couple of euros it definitely makes sense for you personally to start with this live recording sessions if you have a let's say solid fan community james agreed that live shows are a great way to engage your listeners and to make the podcast more interactive so what's really cool about a live show i think even if you're kind of small is that you can use facebook and the word of mouth as kind of like marketing 
everywhere you go. And I do a lot of traveling, so I'm going to be performing this in Berlin. With any luck, I do it in Paris next month, and then Chicago and other places that I visit. So it's kind of like out of the back pocket. Let's make some noise so everywhere I go, do these live shows. And that will kind of slowly drum up the listenership to a point where, finally, I can stop wasting my time with all these other things and focus 100% on making filter stories. And do you think if you have a good idea for a great podcast and if you can showcase some experience already, do you think it's worthwhile to try to pitch it to a podcasting platform as an original? Yeah, sure. This is basically a question, what do you try to achieve? Mm -hmm. Do you simply say, okay, I, I take the money or do you have an idea to build a kind of own brand behind this thing? It, it really depends on your personal preferences. And uh, what advice... Would you give someone if someone wants to pitch it to a platform? It sounds a little bit boring, but it's still, if you have created really a compelling episode or some kind of mood tape, and if it's really good, it will be able to win this race at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about content. What do you think will be the future of podcasting in Germany? Yeah, first of all, hopefully it will be a great future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that the market will grow more and more year by year. But if you look into the last years, I mean, usually every forecast was better than expected, which really can encourage all the podcasters to do more. And on the other hand, I'm also convinced that all the radio stations will start to produce their own podcast because for radio, podcasting will be, let's say, one of the major ways to digitize their own business. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm quite confident that we will have a wonderful future. Well, fingers crossed. There's one last question that we ask everyone. What is your favorite tune currently? Well, I mean, I have to admit that last Friday I was on a concert in Hamburg and the headliner was the Sisters of Mercy. So mm -hmm. I'm a really old man. Thank you so much, Gustav, for your time. It was a really interesting talk. And thank you also for giving the talk at our last after work session. Thanks for the invitation. It was <laughs> a pleasure. Thanks for your time, Christoph, and also a big thanks to Pete and Josie for producing our podcast, and of course to Melodrive for producing our jingle.